Welcome, everyone, to episode 51 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. This episode, we have Kate Hewlett joining us, Jeannie Miller on Stargate Atlantis and David Hewlett's real-life sister. But before we bring her in, if you like Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you click the like button. It really does make a difference with YouTube's algorithm. It will definitely help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you want to get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. Giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. This is key if you plan on watching live and clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next uh, few uh, days and weeks on gateworld.net and eventually dial the gate. It's always been my plan to have dial the gate clips uh, run weekly, but I just, I don't have the manpower yet. So I'm I'm hoping to get some, uh, a, a little bit of help there. Happy Valentine's Day to you all, and in the spirit of that, Kate has some news to share with us, so keep that in mind as you watch this uh, pre-recorded episode. Thanks so much for your time. Kate Hewlett, Jeannie Miller on Stargate Atlantis, and real-life sister of Stargate Atlantis star David Hewlett. Welcome to Dial the Gate. Did you just call him Star David? <laughs> Did I? Yes. <laughs> Stargate Atlantis, David Hewlett. David. I think you were saying Star. Stargate Atlantis star David Hewlett. But Stargate like, Atlantis star so David bad. Hewlett. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. I'm I'm good. I'm uh, I'm busy. I can't complain. I put on makeup for you for the first time in <laughs> you know about eight months. <laughs> it's so strange, isn't it? I hear from people <laughs> who are say like, man, this is. Uh, I'm not used to it, not necessarily makeup, but X, Y, or Z, you know, when we're, when we go out in public and when we associate with other humans, it's like, oh yeah, that's a thing. I forgot to do that. Yeah. I'm worried <laughs> that David might not be washing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got a dog. Hopefully the dog's licking enough. So yeah, I think she does. Huzzah! Ridiculous name. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. It's like, who names their dog for the joke factor? Your so brother. Yeah. So that in the park, people will laugh when you go, huzzah! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I think, think of it that like, way. That's, that's their funny. whole motivation, I think, for naming, it, naming her that. Uh, do you have some news that you'd like to share? <laughs> um, sure, yeah. I, I, I guess, you know, since David told you. Oh, he only told without, me. He didn't tell the world. Without my permission. Um, yes, I can tell you, and I'm going to have some very angry friends who I haven't told yet, but, um, yeah, I'm having, I, I'm, I'm having a baby, <laughs> human, a baby human. Congratulations. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much. Do you know when the due date is? That you're going to say, do you know who the father is? <laughs> I don't, I mean, I wouldn't know the father. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you, my first question is, do you know who the father is? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The due date is May 28th. Oh, I'm wow. really pushing for sooner to avoid the whole Gemini. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I've since learned that I have quite a few very good friends who are Gemini's, so maybe it'll be okay. Well, congratulations to you. That is that is just fantastic. It's so nice to have some good news, you know, these yeah, days. You no, know, a lot of people have been saying that actually. Yeah. When I, when I tell them, the, the other thing people say when I tell them is. Me too. I'm also pregnant because everyone's pregnant. Right the, now. You know what? There's, I mean, you can't really be surprised. You know, I mean, not necessarily about the in general about the uh, the number of babies that are being had oh, yeah. right now because there's only so much that you can do when you're literally nothing else to you know? do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I I thank wow. you so much for sharing that with us. That means so much. Go, that's some and, big news to break. And it, yeah, congratulations that, again. Be, <laughs> What'd you say? Beat that, David's interview. <laughs> ah, I think that that takes the cake. Absolutely. Yeah. So you... it's actually, since you, since you asked, yes, um, it's actually quite a good story because um, I was trying for many years. I was trying for three years with my ex, um, my lovely ex. And I was trying afterwards by myself. I did the donor thing and all that. And I, I hadn't gone to IVF yet because it's very expensive. <laughs> But I had tried sort of, I had exhausted all my other options and I had, I had just done my adoption training and I was really excited about that. And then I kind of, I moved to Hamilton to be closer to my sister and help her out with her, her children. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of like, okay, maybe this is my path. Maybe I'm the aunt and I'm like, you know, I can travel and 
go on cruises for the rest of my life and not have kids. And I was kind of wrapping my head around it. And then it happened by accident <laughs> after, after, you know, being told basically I couldn't have kids. So how funny shocked. life is, <laughs> you know, it's, it, yeah. it's, it, 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 it's so surprised. I mean, you, you almost can't have to say, you know what? I'm not surprised that after all that work, you know, it, it finally, yeah. you cannot, you, you, there are certain things that you just can't force. And, no. and then, you know, no. life just surprises you and oh, it can be both underwhelming and overwhelming and just like, wow, you know, I didn't, yeah, what a journey. Well. How long have you been trying? I mean, I was trying, I was trying for about, I would say I tried for about three or four years. Okay. Yeah. I know Amanda Tapping went on a similar journey as well. Oh. Yeah. So, you know, she, I, I won't, I won't speak for her, but I mean, it was just that, it's not, you know, you, you hear all about all these people like, oh yeah, we're having our sixth, you know, and yeah. it's the, the, um, the inability to get pregnant is actually very common. Oh my know? gosh. Well, so. especially, you know, my dad's an infertility doctor. And so we grew up around this and, and I sort of anticipated having trouble in some weird way because I knew it was such a thing, you know, I knew how really? common it was. Yeah. And nobody in my family is like, my family's like, I'm gonna have a baby. And then they're pregnant. Um, and, uh, and so I was, yeah, like it sort of didn't surprise me in a weird way. You had this but, cloud over you about it. Yeah. yeah like I, I think I thought you meant David. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> David's a cloud. Over me. Uh, yeah, it was sort of like, not even a cloud. I just was like, it's not easy to get pregnant. That's, that's what was in my head like that. But even, even growing up with a dad who's an infertility doctor, I still didn't realize the age thing. I didn't realize how young your body becomes old when it comes to, it's terrible like to use that word but but when it comes to fertility like really after 36 it's considered much much more difficult and mm -hmm. it goes down every year right mm -hmm. so, and there there are things that can happen on in addition to that with the pregnancy i mean there, oh, there yeah. are things uh, the the risk of issues increase all kinds so. of things. Yeah. And it's been like, I, I, I was at the beginning, I didn't tell anyone for a long time. Cause I was like, Ooh, I'm really old. I'm like 150 in pregnancy years. Um, but, uh, I, I'm now, yeah, I'm now like five, five and a half months. I'm 20, whatever, 24 weeks. Do you know the gender or, or have you decided to keep it from yourself you as well? To break that on your show too? No, no, I wasn't <laughs> going to do that. I, I'm asking if you know, Yes, we're having a girl. Ah, <laughs> how wonderful! Yeah, very nice. Is she active? She do somersaults? Oh my gosh! That's great. That's a good she sign. Extremely active. The ultrasounds are always pretty brutal because she's like, yeah, drives them like nuts. Uh huh. Yeah, she's full on alien in there. <laughs> and it feels like I what, what I'm describing it to people as is I feel like I'm pregnant with an eel. Because she's like really, really swimming around in there. But I think I felt some kind of elbow or something yesterday. <laughs> you may have an Olympic like swimmer on your hands. Yeah, so, yeah, maybe. My mother says maybe. I was extremely active too, and I'm more comfortable in the water than I am on land. So <laughs> there you go. I also, I also love swimming. She's yeah. she may be destined. There may be some you know art art stuff going on, which we'll try obviously to dissuade. Um, but my, my boyfriend is a, a musician. Ah, okay. There's a lot of music around the house and she responds. She's been responding to music quite a lot. So, I mean, you can't be surprised when your kid turns into a, a creative creature, you know, it's long scientist. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. We'll start Stargate binge watching sessions early. <laughs> <laughs> wow. so I want to, uh, I want you to take me back a little bit. Um, okay. <laughs> to little, little Kate. Oh, okay. How old was Kate when she realized that she wanted to be a performer? Do you want me to refer to myself in the third person? I mean, you can. <laughs> well, Kate was kind of like Kate, Kate, that. Kate. What to say about Kate? Um, How old were you when you when you learned, you know, I've got the I've got the bug? I feel like it was probably around grade 5. Like I would say probably around age nine. I always liked to make people laugh. I was a bit of a, like I did stuff like my, my, 
<laughs> this is not, this doesn't make me a performer. It makes me an asshole. But <laughs> my, my sister's boyfriend was pulling out of the driveway once when I was, I was probably seven and he was pulling out of the driveway. And as he passed, I went like this and pretended he had run over my foot. And like the guy, like no. he went white, like he went white. Right. And then, and then he was so impressed and he was laughing so hard. And I'm like, I like this feeling. I like that feeling of like, I got all these emotions in just a couple of minutes. Um, but I, I like being, you know, I liked making jokes and, and stuff like that, but um, terrifying adults. But I also, I think when I was in grade five, so about nine or 10 at my, at my high school, I, sorry, I went to one school for 15 years. So. Wow. That's wow. It was a little crazy and it was all girls. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we did like a 15 minute musical thing each class had to do a different musical and we did sound of music. And I think that was, that's when I remember that feeling of being on stage, getting a response, you know, interacting with people on stage. And it just, it was definitely one of those, that was probably the moment I would say that I was like, I actually want to do this. And, and then I've had quite a journey with it afterwards because I, it's, you know, there are times where it feels like, not a viable career and there are times where i definitely felt like not being skinny it wasn't something that i would ever be able to do professional and professionally and so i um i gave up at a couple of points and yeah so it's been sort of a journey but that was the moment where i where i knew who did you play i played maria but <laughs> this also this is also a little insight into my character um it was my friend Andrea and I were still good friends. She's like advertising God, goddess wow. in Canada. She's amazing. She's a rock star. Um, but she, she and I, they, they said, we know we want you two to be Captain Von Trapp and Maria, but we'll leave it up to you to decide which you'll be. And we, and, right. and we, it's all girls. Did that. Yeah. They, yeah. All girls. Yeah. So we went out. I mean, everyone wants to be Maria, right? So we go out into the hall. I still remember this. We got into the hall and I was like, so I'll be Maria. <laughs> He's like, um, yeah, okay. I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> Such a jerk. Such a jerk. I would I kind of was like, you want to become you want to be on trap, right? I mean, everyone wants to be on trap. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't really get the part. I kind of took the part, but we but I acted with her on stage and, and she it was like lovely. It was lovely. We did that moment where he breaks down singing and then I join in and then the audience actually believed us so they started clapping for us because they were like oh the little girl's nervous it's really we felt you know is that level of manipulation is very powerful <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> Tracy Tracy asked me to ask you that question so thank you Tracy oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> so um school plays um how young were you when you got your first gig professional gig uh-huh oh my gosh I would say my first gig, I believe, was um, on a Tay Diggs show called Kevin Hill. Kevin Hill. Yeah, it was either that or Dark Water, which was a Jennifer Connelly movie. Oh, Those okay. were around the same time. Those were my first two professional acting roles, both small but nice for a first, the first role. Um, and the dark water role was fun because it was kind of improv. I was the teacher in the class and I was sort of not, I wasn't really, they didn't focus on me. I was singing Itsy Bitsy Spider and it was all creepy and stuff. And <laughs> I got to improvise a little bit. So that was, that was nice. It was a good way in because I didn't know all the lingo and everything. And that was nice and free. So I didn't make a fool of myself, except that, I had, except that it was an American movie, and I had to I had to sing, "Itsy Bitsy Spider," we have the water sport down the street and watch the water oh. and like the director Walter Salas was the director, amazing, oh. yeah, so lovely. He came over and he was like, um, "So out, <laughs> out," and I'd never even I thought I sounded American, so yeah. It's the I little things, that. right? Little things, yeah. <laughs> um, and then the other first, my other first job was the T Diggs thing. <laughs> this is this is funny, actually. I didn't know, so I had gone to theater school, 
I'd gone to theater school, but they were sort of, they sort of poo-pooed film and TV a little bit. So we didn't really learn very much about it. So I still didn't know the lingo or anything. I didn't know how it really worked. It's a so different I showed, animal. It's a different animal. And I had this scene with Tate Diggs, like my first scene was with Tate Diggs, which, you know, and he's like gorgeous and talented and all that. So I played a kindergarten teacher and, and we, we, <laughs> so we went through the scene and then, um, and then we went to do our first take. And so they're actually shooting and, and the scene was like, I was the teacher and he was picking up his kid from school. Literally, that was it. There's no subtext, nothing. And all of a sudden, <laughs> in the middle of the scene, he just gets like really close. He starts getting really close to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, Tay Diggs. <laughs> Why Tay Diggs? What is going on here? And on camera. And so he gets in all close and, I'm, and, and then he goes, in the scene, he goes, you're on my mark. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it, I was like, oh, that's what those are. That's what those are for. <laughs> so embarrassing. And then we, but he was lovely. We had a long talk afterwards about how they really need to teach film and TV. At the <laughs> right. <laughs> he comes from that world too. Um, yeah. So that was, those were my first two jobs. And I was pretty hooked already. Like I love, I actually love film and TV. I, I, started in theater, but I haven't done much lately. And I, mm. I really do love film and TV. I feel like it's strangely more my home. How is it your niche? Is it the the velocity of it, the the medium itself? Yeah. You know, because a lot of people say the other way. You know, a lot of people say, you yeah. know, theater because you can tell a story from beginning to end, you know? Um, I do love that. I do, I mean, I think with theater, a couple of things, I, I definitely get really bad nerves, as does David. We've, mm -hmm. we've talked about that. I mean, the nerves are really difficult with theater. It's and that's live. The, There's people watching you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's fine when you start, but the, the feeling before is so awful that it's almost not worth the, the, the good feelings for me. And so, and like, if I have if I'm like my, my boyfriend is in come from away or was before the world ended, he was in come from away as the, he's on stage as the drummer. And, um, you know, that show, right? I'm aware of it. Yeah. I've not seen yeah. it. Oh, yeah. it's been, I've but heard it's good. He like, if he has a show at night, he's just normal all day. Yeah. He does. He's fine. But if I have a show at night, it's the whole day is weird. I, I don't feel, I just feel very aware that there's this thing looming anticipation and, yeah and i and i don't feel relaxed and so i i think with film and tv what's lovely is you don't have to get anything perfectly right you're you're sort of rehearsing as you shoot in a weird way and you make you can make different choices and you can go back you know if you mess up you can go back a little bit and keep going and you have control over all of that which i really like you also have freedom to discover stuff on the spot you do yeah. you do you surprise yourself and and I don't get the same nerves. I really don't. Interesting. Um, and then I also, I don't know if this is, I don't know what this is. And it's, it's doesn't say good things about me, but I don't love rehearsing, which most good actors do, <laughs> but I don't love the, the process of rehearsing the same thing for like six weeks. I just, I find by week two, I'm like, okay, we can do this now, unless the script is really dense and there's a lot of text work and all that, which I love. But when you're just kind of, what about this blocking? What about this blocking? And what about the, if there aren't discoveries happening anymore? I just, I just kind of want to do it. Yeah, let's get to it. Yeah. Interesting. And 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 also sometimes I think early instincts for actors and for directors can be good. And sometimes you, you know, oh, it's not funny anymore to us, so we change it but it would have been funny the first way, like that sort of thing. I just, I sometimes feel like rehearsal is not the most beneficial after a certain point, which I know this makes You can squeeze out the magic of something and lose it. You know, yes. it, is, it is possible to overdo it. I agree. So. Yeah, and as a writer, I've seen that too. When my plays are being done, it's mm -hmm. almost like there's this magic in the first read through and the first week where they're, where they're finding it all and you're like, yes, you get it, you get it. And then it gets kind of, what if she meant it this way? And I'm like, she's here, she's right here. She didn't mean it that way. <laughs> she's in the room. Um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, I like that about with, with TV and film. It's like, learn your lines, 
show up and and do your work. What I what I miss, uh, the, I miss the days when you had more time to shoot. You know, it's crazy. This show that I just finished, we are shooting. There there were days where because they're block shooting everything. There were days where I had twenty eight pages of dialogue in okay. two days. Oh my god. Wow. And stuff. stuff. So it's, so it's like that I'm, I'm not probably able to do my absolute best because I'm sometimes I'm just remembering. Yeah. Just getting through it. Just getting through it and not necessarily, you don't have the time to make choices. And I mean, you make little choices, but you don't have the time to really dig in. Whereas before, if you got a guest star role, for instance, you would have usually at least seven days or, and now it's literally one day one day or two days and you do your whole part. So it's hard to give your best work in those situations. That would, that would be my only, my only thing about film and TV now is I think it's all sort of budget based and scheduling based and they don't necessarily think about the acting side of it and how it might take a little longer to make those decisions and find things. But if that is, like if that's the going trend, we're in trouble. <laughs> I mean, you yeah, have yeah. to have room to breathe and interpret a role. You know, I mean, rehearsal does have its place, but yeah. you have to you have to create an opportunity for a little bit of spontaneity to mm -hmm. discover something that's that's you know. So you have to you have to service the documents, obviously, but yeah. you also have to have the freedom to find what's not on the page, what's between the lines, yeah. and work with the director and all that stuff that you really that's really lost when it's so so quick. I think I have baby brain, but it sort of was happening before. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, that's that's the one thing that's a bit of a frustrating trend. But it did happen in theater too. It was like, that's oh, true. you can put on a show in three weeks. Oh, great, let's do it. And it's like, yeah, but uh, yeah, we can put it on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can force this thing through my eye, but it'll hurt like yeah. hell. So whatever. <laughs> American stuff still takes more time. You know, I think they they. Um, David's working on all kinds of big American things. I'm sure they're not doing 20 pages in two days. Um, but a lot of the stuff here is very quick. Have you been in touch with him lately? You, you, get to, you get to see him at all? or It's funny. With COVID, I, I feel like I have seen him so little. Mm. And I don't miss him. <laughs> no, <laughs> we, you know something? We have one of those relationships where we don't talk that often, okay. but we're very close. And that's a lot of my friendships are like that too. It, I don't have to talk to someone every day. He, mm -hmm. he and I have such a rapport and we, so we don't talk that often. He does call sometimes. I'm not always the best at answering my phone, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, we, we, we have a really good reputa reputation. Oh my Reparte. God, I have a fabulous reputation, <laughs> David. Um, yeah, we have a good repartee and we have a good relationship and we don't need to talk that often. But I miss seeing him in person. Baz, you're not going to recognize him by the time, you know, this is all said and it, done. So so they came for like, uh, they actually made the drive to Hamilton oh. for the first time since I moved here. They made the drive. They brought Huzzah. <laughs> we all the dog. Out the backyard, which is enormous. I oh, good. Enormous backyard. And uh, we all had a hangout out there. And so I got to see how tall Baz is and they, they were all wearing their Grinch masks and um, <laughs> it was really, it was really nice. Oh, um, David, David and I hardly spoke because he, <laughs> he showed up, we had a little quick catch up and then he was like, oh, you have a fire pit? And then he spent literally four hours trying to light a fire. <laughs> and so then the night they just left and there was no fire. <laughs> But he was like a child. He was occupied the entire time. So I mostly just watched the game. And, and uh, David, and by the way, I'm pregnant. Yeah. I, I think I, I told them on the phone. I had told oh, okay. Them. Yeah. <laughs> no, lighting fire. No, got to get back to fire. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's funny. Fire, fire. So funny. He, he has a task and he's he's good. He's good to go. There are people in your life that, you know, you you just have to occasionally remind them that you love them. Yeah. And you're good. There are others that's like, you know, if, if, especially for me, you know, if I don't see them in a, in like a month or something, I start going, okay, what's wrong? What have I done? You know? And I can't, I can't let that go, you know? So it's, it's cool if you can get into a place where 
we're good. I love you. Everything's good. You ch- you good? All right. We're good. You know? I wish all relationships were like that. <laughs> yeah, I right? really do. don't need a ton of contact. Yeah. And so yeah. I do have trouble. There, I do have friends who really like to talk often. And I, I and they worry, I think, that, that I'm not okay or that I'm, you know. Right. It's not them. that, you know? So, I mean, for some people it is, don't get me wrong, but yeah. Yeah. I just want to, I want to check in yeah. and then we're good. But, but I find what happens also is I leave it for so long that yeah. when I do, when we talk for three hours yeah. and it's lovely, but then it's like a marathon, you know, it feels, it feels like a social marathon. Yeah, there's some things with certain people that you just want to know everything and it's going to take a while to get through. Yeah. So Petra mm-hmm. wanted to know, um, and I the do name. as well. Yes. <laughs> Kate, um, <laughs> <laughs> who, who has personally inspired you in your life? Who has personally inspired me in my life? I, I have, you know, honest, honestly, I'm uh, lucky to say that a lot of people have. I had some incredible teachers in high school, incredible teachers. Uh, Miss Davidson was one of them. Susan Davidson, incredible, very wonderful teacher. Marina Kelton was another. These are people who were huge influences on my life. English teacher and um, and what Miss Davidson, I still call her that. Um, <laughs> she she was my teacher in grade four and grade six, and we're still in contact now. Ah, yeah. Um, so so a lot Gotta of gotta love the internet. Oh my gosh, I know. Yeah, like a lot of teachers had a real impact on me. Uh, I would also say, career wise, as much as I hate to admit it. Uh, I, I do think David had a huge impact on me because I saw an example of someone doing what they wanted to do and, and it working. So I think despite the fact that he really did always say, don't be an actor, do not, whatever you do, don't go into acting. Um, I didn't listen to him. I just sort of watched and saw, oh, this is, this is possible. And, and I also see the way he is on set, the way he is with the crew the way that everyone's an equal, he doesn't ever pull the actor stuff where it's sort of going to the front of the lunch line and all this stuff that I, I know it's normal to do that, but I, I, it makes my skin crawl. Um, I, I just, that whole weird hierarchy where they, where everyone treats you with kid gloves and it's like, you're, you're at the top, but you're also kind of at the bottom because you're sort of like babies <laughs> that are being uh, right? looked after. Um, I really like it when the cast and the crew are all buddies and it's, respect everyone's doing their job you know doing the work it. yeah they're there to do the work. work everyone's an expert at their own particular field and so i i saw that with him and i i hopefully have learned that and yeah and and i think in many ways he has he's been a huge influence also as a parent um i think that will he'll influence me a great deal as well you know, you just give just give the kid a device and <laughs> right. Let them do the thing. <laughs> <They're settled. laughs> Don't worry days. about wiring their brains that way. No. <laughs> it's cool. Plug them in right now. Just get it Thank over with. Dad. Good hair, you know, good style. <laughs> give them a device and off they go. No, he's he's a really great he's a really great dad. So yeah. That's my cheesy answer. <laughs> that's that, no, that's good. Um Cam wanted to know, uh uh, did uh, did the McKay do the McKay siblings in any way resemble uh, the Hewlett siblings when it comes to <laughs> any of the quirks? I mean, David is much grumpier and more irritable and more of a know-it-all in real life, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think our our dynamic of teasing each other. And the bickering and some of that. I think we even, I, I can't remember if we slapped each other's forehead in that in Stargate or if I did, only did it in Dog's Breakfast. We do I that. I think there may have been. Yeah. There was plenty yeah. of it in Dog's Breakfast and the sound yeah. effects to go along with it. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> like, like beef slapping on a grill. Or, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. We, we have that, but always in, always jokey in real life. Always with, with sort of. We're very, very, very affectionate. Yeah, very mean to each yeah. other, but, but we, um, <laughs> but yeah, very, very affectionate. As well. Not affectionate, <laughs> very loving, let's say. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, we, no Hewlett's want to be touched. Um, but I think David is quite different from his character, honestly. 
except except when he's hungry. The, the McKay comes out when he's hungry, or if he's making a, a movie and he's really stressed, like yeah, his own. If he's making his own movie. He gets he gets a little McKay. Well, I mean, you can you can kind of appreciate that. There's a there is a um, a a drive and determination to McKay that uh, g- gives no quarter to any fools. You know, yeah. and so it, it's it's a way to get stuff done. But, you know, there are casualties along the way. But, you know, when you've got to get work done, you know, but I mean, he's he's never been one to mistreat people. You know, I spent a lot of hours on set watching him work and go through that material and the the amount of text that he would have to ingest and then put out just bleh, belch it out in sequence, you know, yeah. with techno babble to boot. You what now? Yeah. And make it funny. And make it funny. Yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. That was a no. hard job, you know? And you got your fair share of it as well. I did. I, I did. And I wasn't, I was not as prepared for it as he was, I gotta say. Um, I mean, I was prepared, but I, I I knew the lines, but then there are moments with that sort of text where you're just where you do just go blank. Because all of a sudden it's like words. When you're bringing it to like, life, it's a it's a language in a, in and of its own, and it's a rhythm. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was. I, I definitely went totally blank on a couple of things, but um, he and I both don't learn lines easily, as well. So it takes it does take quite a bit of work. There are people who just kind of read it and know it, mm-hmm. and we both we both have to work to learn them. So he put a lot of hours in learning those lines, and he. Um, and yeah, he was amazing. And I think that the thing is, the better, the better you are, the more they give you, right? The more they're like, oh, give it right. to him. Right. That's, what like, happens. that's what happens. Yeah. And he, so he, he, he indicated to me in December that it's also, he found it, it's, it's a muscle that can atrophy because yeah. if he hasn't done it as much, then he has, mm-hmm. he, it takes him longer to get back into the rhythm of absorbing information or absorbing the lines before giving it, giving them back out again. You know, yeah, which is kind of scary like, in itself. It's not like a, it's not like riding a bicycle. Once you got it, you got it. You can lose the ability to absorb like a sponge and you have to retrain yourself how to do it. I have news for you though. You can also lose the ability to ride a bicycle. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I, I speak from experience. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> that, saying, that saying is not so true. <laughs> wow. Ah. <laughs> uh, two years later, I was like, no. The center of gravity changed or something. <laughs> oh my god! But um, but yeah, it's true. You do lose the muscle. Although it, it comes back pretty quickly. Like I just, I just had a lead on a series for the first time in a few years, and it's, it's when you're when you're learning ten pages a night or whatever it is that it, it comes back. It does come back quickly. Where you're mm-hmm. like, okay, this is how I do this, and I've done a lot more listening to the lines lately. Like I record them. And I just have my headphones in and I listen to them over and over wherever oh, I go. Oh, you, you off. learn orally. Yeah. I yeah. don't usually, but oh, you this don't. time I tried it. This time I tried it. And it, yeah, it does go in. You know, I have to do both. I have to look at it first, kind of digest it that way. And then, but then at least, at least when you're doing other things, if you're playing the, the words, it just becomes a little more familiar. And then the drive in and stuff, I would, I would listen to my headphone. Like I had a driver and so I would listen mm. to my headphones headphones and learn it that way. Um, but I think the other thing is there's, there's the muscle side of it, but I think also you don't have the nerves the same way when you're doing it every day and you're working with the same people, you're not feeling like you have to impress them. And so you just kind of do your work and show up and they know you can do it. Whereas if you're doing a guest star or something, it's more nerve wracking because you don't want to look like you didn't prepare, even if you did, you know? Right, you want to put your your deliberate in putting your best foot forward, forward rather exactly. than not worrying about it. It'll come. Yeah, and you get in your own head about it. Like, do I actually know this? Or right. Yeah, so I find that makes a difference too. Is having a comfort a comfort on set. The story of how you got into Atlantis is an interesting one. Um, Martin Garrow told us uh, over at GateWorld a few years ago that. Uh, well, okay, let me set this up here. So in season one. For, for those who are in the know and those who are and need a refresher and those who don't, uh, there is a an episode called Letters from Pegasus, where David as McKay has a uh, line near the end of the episode that was originally written to reference a sibling that was a brother. Yeah. And then David went to Martin Garrow and a couple of the other writers and producers and said, I actually have an actress sister 
Mm-hmm. Would you mind if we change this to a sister? And, and he never lets me forget it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they and Martin Garrell recalls, oh, yeah, whatever, Dave, fine. We're not, yeah, not going to hire your sister, man. Yeah, exactly. Uh. What was, do you recall the play where David and Martin and maybe a couple of the others came and saw you? And Martin was like, she's, we've got to do an episode with her. So that was coincidental. That was coincidental. So Brendan Gall. Yes. Martin's best friend. Martin's best friend, you know, world, uh, dominating the world now in TV writing. They wrote, they created Blind Spot together and all that. They have like 25 shows. Um, Right. But, uh, so Brendan and I had met a couple of years before and I was, I was part of his whole crowd. Like we just all hit it off and we started doing theater together with Unspun Theater, which was a theater company and still going. And so it was through, Martin was only there because of Brendan. Oh, and then okay. he, saw me, he saw me and he was like, Hewlett. And he, made the connection and then i think that was the first thing where he was like oh i could actually this could actually work i can't remember if it was it was the play was probably head smashed in buffalo jump <laughs> that's a title <laughs> it's a title it's a place in alberta okay it's a place in alberta and it was a collective creation that that i worked on with brendan and with a bunch of my friends and it might have been that that he saw. I think that was it. And Brendan directed it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And ended up becoming Caleb Miller, Jeannie's yeah. husband in Atlantis. Yeah. Yes. How cool, man. And I guess there's a character called Brendan Gall as well. Who, yes. Who, he died in season one. He got eaten by a rape. <laughs> there you go. That's right. <laughs> Um, that's what you get if you cross Brent, uh, Martin Garrow. Martin Garrow, that's right. Yeah, no, so yeah, so it was through it was through that I think. So it was kind of that lucky. Yeah. So let's set the stage. You get a call. We've got a story, or does did how did how did that happen? Season three, McCann misses Miller. Me, yeah, David told me that he had planted the seed. Mm-hmm. with the letters of the Pegasus thing, but he didn't, he didn't make a big deal out of it because this business, like. Correct. Right. This business and yeah. sci-fi, you, you never, they might've wanted some six foot tall Cylon. <laughs> <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong show. But right. uh, yeah, you know, you, you never know. And so yeah. he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't like, this is going to happen. Right. And no, then, you know, oh, it's just an idea. Yeah. And then, oh, and then he did dog's breakfast. And he cast me in Dog's Breakfast, and we were supposed to do before. that as a tiny. Yeah, it was before. Okay. And so that was also an opportunity for us to play that dynamic, very similar dynamic, show our our chemistry on screen. So he he thought about that too, and I think that was also part of it. So so Dog's Breakfast happened, and then I guess with. Um, I mean, with Stargate, they wrote the script and it was very much in our voices. And I, I don't know, I didn't know Martin yet. So mm-hmm. he's he has this, a similar, we all have a similar voice, honestly. But he wrote those characters. And then David, I think when David saw the script, then he was like, this well, could actually happen. Yeah, exactly. And, you, and obviously I still had to audition, right? Because I hadn't done very much. I think I had only done one show and then those two episodes I told you about. And so I auditioned and it, I think I got a call back. I can't remember. I can't remember if I did a call back or if if I didn't need to. And then I booked it and it was, it was insane. It was insane. I didn't think it would happen. I had no money. I had no, I was doing theater. I was living with like five roommates. It was, it it came out of nowhere. You're doing what you love, you know? Yeah. You got to do what you have to do to make it work. You know? Yeah. So I was saying, don't act. Yeah, I know. So. I know. Obviously but it, he didn't it, push you too hard on that, thankfully. No, he did push me, but I don't listen to anyone. So um, <laughs> good for you, girl. If pushed, I, 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 yeah, I push back. But uh, yeah, so it happened, and I remember reading the script and being like, I can't believe this is actually real because it was a hefty guest star too. It was yeah, 
Definitely the biggest thing I'd ever done. Definitely. And, you know, going to Vancouver and staying at the Sutton place and right. It's not a great hotel. Oh my gosh. And I'd been watching the show too. So it was just like, this is insane. And, and it went, it went really well. It went really smoothly until the one scene where I did have a lot of the, the techno babble and, and it was Amanda, myself and David, and we, we did it in blocking and I, I knew all the lines and it was perfect. And then when the cameras were on, I was like, <laughs> and so that was yeah. the first, that was the moment where, and also I had done, it was a red eye flight and then right to the studio uh-huh. fitting. And so it was all kind of, and then I'm on the set and I'm like, there's a star date and what's going on. And uh, so I, I, I had one of those moments where I was like, oh gosh, I'm having trouble getting through this. And I didn't know you could sort of stop and go back. And, uh, but they were, those were the two best people for that to happen with because she was so lovely. Amanda was so lovely. Those and, are the two that oh my the gosh. scripts have always gone to for yeah. the information, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, you're not going to find better teachers. True. And also, they were so understanding when it didn't come because they were like, sometimes they didn't know either. And correct. You know, we, it's happened to all of them. Them. all of them. Yeah, absolutely. And David was really lovely about it. Like, he didn't make fun of me, <laughs> which he sometimes would, but he didn't. Um, and yeah. And so it was, it was, it was a, phenomenal experience what was it like blocking with two davids i mean obviously uh, on the set when you were guys were blocking there was another there was a stand-in you know and then the standard would turn into a tennis ball (laughs) yeah Yeah, the whole thing i forgot about that the fact that it was one of my earlier gigs and so i didn't really know what was normal and what wasn't normal so i'm like i guess you talk to tennis balls and film and tv (laughs) all right uh the stand-in thing was funny because uh they got someone who was the same height as David and had the same, well, they gave him the same haircut. <laughs> but then <laughs> I went into makeup one day and there was this piece of wax paper with all these blobs, like disgusting brown blobs on it. And I was like, what is that? And then they're like, those are David's moles. <laughs> David's moles. And they had to match, like he had a big moles. mole. On the back of his neck. <laughs> they put this like big mole on the back of the guy's neck. And David was like, is that what I look like from behind? And I'm like, <laughs> it actually is a tiny mole, but you know. But still, you have to get it right. And if you see that, you know, he never sees back there. He's like, I have a giant mole in the back of my neck. He's like, it can't be that size, right? Wow. But it was, yeah. It's the little things. They're going to get it right, you know? Oh my gosh. And it worked. It worked beautifully. It absolutely did. And it was fun watching him play two different parts as well. Um, so, cause he was having a bit of a different experience than he would usually have too, right? So he was, cause it was a new character for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one that's actually chill. Yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't play those characters a lot. Well, I mean, it's, that. he can do them, but it's, he's not making magic necessarily when he's, mm-hmm. he can pull it off, you know, oh, yeah, but he can do everything. Angst but McKay not, he is. Get those roles, right? right? Like he doesn't get those like cool, chill guy roles. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's not his specialty. Yeah, but he exactly. can do it. So. Also, not my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so nice to see, you know, a, an episode where the the stakes were definitely high, but they were high for another universe. And the stakes for us were the relationship between uh, the b- relationship between a brother and a sister. You mm-hmm. know, because Atlantis didn't do that a great deal. Stargate, in general, you know. Uh, SG one did it definitely, but it was it was definitely nice to see Atlantis take it a couple of a couple of lower keys and say, you know, yes, yeah. th- there is a problem. It's a problem happening to them next door in this other universe. And mm-hmm. once it's done, you know, the 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 reason that people are tuning in is to see Rodney resolve a few things with yeah. with uh, Kate with Kate with Jeannie. Kate. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think you know the relationships in any show. I think the relationships are in the end, what keeps people coming back and what made it a popular episode as well, right? It's, it's a, you're seeing a different side of a character. You're, it explains a lot of why he is the way he is. You see a softer side to him. You mm. have someone calling him out on stuff that no one ever calls him out on. Someone smarter than him, all of that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I think, yeah, I mean, it was brilliant. Obviously, Martin is an incredible writer who's, who's doing so well. Man. Yeah, he's, he's definitely so succeeded for sure. I want to sidestep Atlantis for a minute. You what now? 
that beard. Oh, I know. It's, I so, it, I mean, it's so luxurious. His so. career is impressive, but his beard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's magnificent. <laughs> I haven't talked to him in a long time, actually. We I worked on LA. Either. Yeah. 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 We, we both need to reach out to him, say, come at him from both sides, say hello. Yeah. Folk yeah. Tunes wanted to know a little bit more about working on a dog's breakfast. Now, if you have not seen this movie, folks, you need to, I think, I'm not sure if it's streaming somewhere. You can definitely rent it uh, through the internet. Do it because it is a riot. If you like, you know, um, David Hewlett's sense of sensibilities and sense of humor. This is a fantastic uh, film. And Kate has, uh, and Paul McGillian, you know, and Christopher Judge guest stars as well, and Rachel Luttrell. You Lush. can't, yeah, yeah. you need to see this movie. It is funny. Oh my God. What was it like filming this? It was his first was... big, you know, independent project. Oh yeah. And it was supposed to be, David, myself, and Paul shooting in David's house with limited crew. And it just kind of exploded. I think people on like the Stargate crew really liked him. And so people started volunteering their time and the DP was amazing. And he, so he came on board and it just grew and grew and grew. And then they were like, we can't really do this at our house. We need to rent. A and so there was this stunning, weird property in like Burnaby, I think it was where we, is that what I mean? Burnaby? It's middle of nowhere. You know, NBC. Great scene. Yeah. Like, I sometimes like at Burbank and Burnaby. And right now it was Burnaby. Very <laughs> um, yeah. This property with, with, I mean, this endless backyard that then turned into a lake even more so when they, when there was a rainstorm and it flooded and I mean, all <laughs> kinds of crazy stuff. Like there's a scene where they're in a boat or something. I think so. If I'm that if was I, not if, supposed to happen, I don't remember. Yeah, that it was just. I, I remember watching it for the first time because um, uh, Jane had sent it to me. I was I was the Gate World got to screen it first, and I was like, I can't believe I'm watching this, and I'm loving it. It's just so <laughs> out there. There there's an accidental death. Let's say that you know, yeah. and it just the script goes in places where you wouldn't expect it, um, yeah. and it was just. It, it, it's it's a riot of physical comedy. You know, this was yeah. something that I don't think we really see that much of anymore, at least the stuff that I certainly don't watch, uh, that I certainly watch, but um, it was just a riot. Yeah. The thing with the physical comedy is that David <laughs> just did everything. He didn't, nothing was <laughs> safe. <laughs> he would just fall. And it's like, ooh, but it's so good. You know, when you watch it, the physical comedy is so good because well, you just kind of went for it. The whole sequence on the ladder, you know, oh and God. that's happening in the background with Paul. It's yeah. like, how did they pull some of this stuff off? Yeah, it was incredible, actually. He, he's really, David's a really good director. It's, it's very hard to break into the TV directing world. And I'm shocked that he hasn't had more directing gigs because he's really good, like, he understands it from all sides, you know? Um, but on that, because he was directing as well as acting and he had written it mm -hmm. and he was producing it, it was sort of like the acting was almost the least important thing. So when he went to act, he just kind of threw himself around. <laughs> just, <laughs> and then he would come back. And, and so it was, it, was a, it was a different performance from him. It was very, uh, I don't know, it was totally insane. Totally insane. But yeah, there's a scene where there's a boat in the backyard and there's not, there was not supposed to be water back there. Well, you there know, was not water back there when we started. When the opportunity arises, you know, throw, throw a scene together, rent a boat and do yeah. it. You yeah. Know? It was what a muddy shoot. What, what a great, a great mm -hmm. story. You know, you and Paul were fantastic. Uh, the little Stargate yeah. nods all over the place. I really wish that, cause there was talk a little bit about trying to do a, a, um, a show within a show with Starcrossed. You know, oh, which yeah. I still think would have been a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And then David and I also had an idea, um, a dog's bed and breakfast. <laughs> was, uh, that they, they turn the house into a and b and oh. then it's haunted. It's haunted. And there's like all these, like, it, it was really fun. You he, can still do it. Said, yeah, we have. Yeah, we've talked about it a lot, actually. Um, breakfast. Poor Mars. I miss Mars. I know Mars would have been in it, but now we may have to use my my Russian rescue dog, who, oh. who's 
<laughs> Mars, is, Mars is tinier, more nervous uh, cousin. Not really. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, Assassinate. Uh, Jessica, 1993, wanted to know, were there any more, are there any more plans to do more episodes? She says, they were my gateway to Stargate. I know, I like that. Um, I, uh, we, I have, I wrote one. Okay. I wrote one we never shot because we just got busy. He got busy, I think, at that time. We may have written two, actually, that we never shot. But we ha we'd have to revisit it and see if, see if those still work. Um, we also had a, a show based on that that we were pitching around for a while, which was called Assassinate as well. And it was about the dating. It was about a brother and sister running this weird dating site and um, where you where people connect through video games. And we pitched that around to all the Canadian networks like 10 years ago or whatever. And it didn't. Yeah, we didn't get any development deal or anything, but um, I mean, it was so much fun. We should have been doing it during COVID, because honestly, right. it's so, like perfect. AK, while well, the COVID sun is killing all of us, right? Yes. Jeez, man. Yeah. It, it's the kind of the perfect COVID show in a way. But uh, yeah, we don't have any plans. To, it's just we've been so we both have been so busy. Yeah. And you're not going to be, you know, busy for, you know, at all yeah. in the future here. So yeah, now right? I'm going to step for 17, 18 years. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my God, I'm so busy right now though. I can't even, I'm trying to pack everything in now. I I don't Ooh. blame you, you know, cause once it, once it starts, it's like, well, here we go. Oh my gosh. So. Do you have kids? No. Do you have kids? No, you don't. Do no. you have any kids? No, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not in the cards for me. I'm blissfully oh. single. So. Okay. So I'm an only child. So, you know, it's, that's kind of, okay. I've always been happy in the company of my own thoughts. So, okay. but I've got a lot of friends. So. That's good. Yeah. Little young, young friends. I do have to ask you about the shrine. Okay. What an amazing episode that Brad Wright wrote. Um, Tearjerker every time I watch it. Mm -hmm. And you said you were actually having to hold your laughs in while you were making some of it because it was hard to see David acting like someone who was losing his mind. Mm -hmm. But when you pull it, when it's on screen, when, you know, that that final edit that they chose, it is completely 100% believable when you two were in the same scene together. Because, I mean, I'm sure you were able to also get yourself into a space where these kind of things do happen to people. Oh, gosh, yeah. And I don't remember... I don't, I mean, I don't, there are lots of things I don't remember, but I don't remember actually saying that because, um, and in fact, the trouble I had was I couldn't stop crying. Oh, we both couldn't maybe stop I'm crying. misremembering from another scene then. Maybe it might've been another, well, you know what? I had a, I had a ton of trouble with laughter in Miller's Crossing. Okay. Like a ton of, the Stephen Culp and I Stephen had a Culp. Giggling problem, like huge giggling problem. Okay. Um, I apologize David, then, because then I'm I'm probably misremembering. No, I, you know what? It may have happened, and it may have happened in other scenes. But the scene, the scene where I first talked to him when he's and realized that he, how far gone he is, and we have that whole scene where he's like he recognizes me, and that scene, I couldn't read it without crying, and I. When we did the blocking, you know, you, I, I've since learned, don't act in the blocking. <laughs> Just yeah. say the line yeah. in the blocking. But when we did the blocking, I was bawling. Can't help it sometimes. Couldn't help it, and he was, and he was really em emotional, and and um, so I, it was almost like we had to, and, you know, no one wants to watch the two of you be like, <laughs> like that's right. not the story, right? That's not the and story. And I hold it together, so. Um, yeah, that was that was the the issue I had with that scene, and then I'm sure I'm, I always have giggling problems, so I'm sure there were other scenes. <laughs> but but I think any anything where he was doing that, the memory loss and all of that, it was really hard to watch. Like, yeah, and we you know we went through that with our grandmother, both our grandmothers and stuff. So the, you know, watching someone someone very sharp not be there anymore. Of, not be there anymore is, is, yeah, it was, and it was just so beautifully written, like you said, I mean, beautifully written. Brad Port is hardened to that, you know, and you, you could tell 
that he was he was hitting something that was really truthful. Yeah, he's so. an exquisite writer as well. Like he he's so talented. That man can put two people in a room together and just make them make them do make you feel anything for him. Yeah. And that was an episode where you really got I mean you went on a mission. You were really a part of that that Stargate Operations team in that episode. That's you know? Yeah, exactly. You got to right. How cool was that? And you know, Momoa. some scenes with Jason Momoa and that I I detected like there that there almost could have been a thing between the two of them had Jeannie not been married. You know, <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I believe me. I tried to pitch this. <laughs> <laughs> so what if I love Brendan to pieces? But what if, for instance, Caleb died? He exploded. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. I wondered. I wondered if they were going to do a, a, a Jason Momoa, uh, yeah, romance or something, because it would have been also would have really irked Rodney. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Were she not taken, it would have made total sense. So, <laughs> so. Uh, we did hug though. We oh, did abso hug. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> The photographic evidence. <laughs> Brent and Jonas wanted to know, uh, would you be open to returning to Stargate in uh, a potential fourth series? Because nah. Brad has been... <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> Brad's, Brad's trying to get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would love to. I, I would love to, obviously. And I think the world needs Stargate right now. It's like sort of... More optimistic sci-fi. Yeah, not bleak sci-fi. I think the bleak stuff is is hard right now, you know? I mm -hmm. don't I don't think Ted Lasso would have been such a massive hit three years ago as it is now, because it's just joy. People want joy and optimism and smart optimism. Shows are definitely products of their time, but the, it's it's just because it takes it takes a little while for things to ripple, you know, for mm -hmm. things to get into production. So things like that mm -hmm. catch people at a time where it's like you know what? I really need this now. Yeah. Ted Lasso, yeah. case in point. So yeah. it's um, but it's an excellent time for programming. You know, especially television, oh, yeah. where we're doing all these serialized, getting all these serialized dramas now, and it's these novels are coming to life. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I've seen some amazing stuff lately. What have you been watching? I, I watched The Dig. Have you seen The Dig? I've heard about this. So it's good. It's a movie. It's not a TV series. Oh, okay. It, it's it's beautiful. It's okay. I mean, it reminded me of Remains of the Day or something like that. It's very slow, but very intriguing and very slow in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. And Ray Fiennes is amazing. Carrie Mulligan is always amazing. good. Like the little kid is amazing. It's it's a beautiful movie, really beautiful movie. And um, the Trial of the Chicago Seven, I loved as well. Okay, yeah. I'll check it out. Have and it's you been a while since I've seen good movies, so it was nice to see a couple of good movies. Have you seen the Grand Budapest Hotel? Ages ago. Okay, that yeah. it, it, texturally, because Ray Fiennes, you said texturally, it reminds me very much of a dog's breakfast in terms oh, yeah. of the emotions that you leave that you leave with it. That is yeah. top three favorite movies of mine. Incredible. And you know, right now, see see Grand Budapest Hotel, people, if you haven't seen it, yeah, see it because it's it's a great film to watch, especially now. So smart, so funny, so quick. He the is right. Ray finds us out of this world. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, my answer to the Stargate question is yes, of course. I would I would love nothing more. I I really yeah, it's I haven't done sci-fi in so mm -hmm. long and it'd be really fun to return to those characters if we got to do that and you know, see see how many kids uh, Jason Momoa and I have and <laughs> they catch up with us. <laughs> <laughs> And Madison would be uh, could probably be working at the SGC by now. Yeah, seriously. You know, yeah. I wouldn't wouldn't be surprised at all if there's a if there's a, a Madison Miller um, yeah. specialist working at you know whatever Stargate base there is. Oh, so, gosh, you weren't a mom yet, but you played a mom well. Thank you. That's no one all would I have thought. That's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, swear, I, I, I think I'm a mom in everything I do. It's so funny. And I was like, oh, I'm not one in real life, but I'm everything. I mean, I just, yeah, I just came off another, another show where I'm, where I'm the mom. What shows this? It's actually, uh, it's two shows. Okay. Uh, it's a really incredible concept. It's two shows. It's the, it's called the Parker Andersons and Amelia Parker. And 
one of them is told from the little girl's perspective, the daughter, and one of them is told through more of the parents' perspective, the family perspective. It's two shows. Yeah, it's two shows that, and so each episode, like there, there are two pilots. Okay. And they tell different stories, but there's overlap. So it's really cool if you watch both episodes, you get little scenes where you're like, oh, that's what was happening in the other. That's an interesting so, idea. It's really interesting. It, it, it really is. And it's also about, it's sort of like the Brady Bunch with a mixed race family. Okay. So it's uh, uh, my, my, I get married to this wonderful British man who is a famous soccer player in England or was a famous soccer player in England. And he moves his whole family over to Chicago and we, we move in together. And it's sort of about, it deals, it delves into race a ton, which, uh, which was really, really incredible to work. It's a comedy primarily. It's a half hour family comedy, but we talked about all kinds of things and they talked about racial profiling. They talked about small, small, but significant things like my daughter in the show, not being able to find my black daughter in the show, not being able to find makeup at a store because right. no, it's not a, own. yeah, stuff. Exactly I right. never, yeah, I, I, I will say I, I learned a great deal. Um, it's an entirely BIPOC writer's room. The showrunner is my friend, Anthony Farrell, who's, he worked, he wrote on the office okay. for seasons and he's a genius and uh, he's show running it. Um, is this, so yeah, is it going to be, a, is it, does it have an American pickup or is it, is it Canadian only? At the or? moment we only have an American. Um, oh, the, it is American right now. BYU. Okay. Yeah. Which they have everything. They have, they have so much programming. I had no idea. I, I, it's, we were joking that. I, I really am joking, but that I'm the I'm the Meryl Streep of Mormon television because <laughs> because like I think they have Holly Hobby, which I'm on. They have Mallory Towers, which I wrote. They have this one, and then uh, the show that I was writing from May until October. This awesome comedy, which I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about that yet. But it's a really fun comedy. Same showrunner. Okay. It's a sci-fi comedy. Oh really? Okay. It is smart and funny and just so much fun. I wrote three episodes of that. Also BYU. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You, I, yeah. I can't wait to see some of this stuff. So that's, that's right. I'm, I definitely am interested in this. Uh, yeah. So does it have a, a Parker Anderson's Amelia Parker? Does that have a release date yet? Um, not officially. Okay. But I will say it's, it's happening fast. Okay faster than I would have anticipated. Okay. Uh, a lot of this stuff has been pushed right through. So. Yeah. Yeah. We shot all through the pandemic. It was, it was nuts. How and is it realigning and, and uh, going through a lot of this uh, uh, extra procedural stuff in order to make sure that everyone's safe? Uh, Joe Flanagan talked about it a little bit. Martin Wood also talked about it. You know, everyone's wearing watches. To, to keep distance between themselves. Uh, how is it, how, how has it been shooting through the pandemic? Everyone's wearing watches to keep distance between themselves? Martin, Martin Wood on his set, he, there was a proximity watches. Oh my God. I was like, do people hate watches? <laughs> yeah, they're, pro they're, they're, they're like, Ugh, it's it's a pro it has a proximity watch. alarm inside of it. So. That's crazy. Yeah. Gosh, I, that's brilliant. Um, it was really hard. It was really hard. It was really, uh, I was really anxious. And you know, you, you, you kind of forget about it during the day because you have to, on the acting side of it, you have to right. normal. Yeah. You have to, you, there's no, <laughs> no proximity alarms when you're acting. So um, it was hard, but they, they did a good job. You know, they, everyone's, everyone was learning together. And the producer, Jim Corston did a, did a really good job. And anytime I had an issue, he was on it right away. Cause it's, it's, it's hard to, to, it's hard to test everyone and to get it all organized and mm -hmm. coordinated. And, you know, you're casting day players and guest stars and did that person get tested and when did they get tested and all, you know, it's, it's, and then background performers and like, it's, it was a lot, it was a lot, but um, they did a good job. It was stressful though. Well, you know, you're working. You know, not a lot of people in LA can say that. And that's- I was lucky this year. I worked all through the year and I, I, I mean, I cannot 
complain about anything. It was, you know, I was, I was working straight through from May till the end of the year. Wow. So. Good yeah. for you. That's great. Yeah. Kate, I am so excited for you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and everything that's going to be, to, to be coming your way. You, you deserve <laughs> nothing but the best. Oh, that's and, very nice. <laughs> uh, really looking forward to, uh, uh, the, is it a mini series? Is it, is it a limited series? No, it's a, it's a family. You mean the one, the one Parker Anderson's Amelia yeah. Parker. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's like, uh, it's 20 episodes. Oh, it 10, is. 10 for each show. Okay. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. Regular TV half hour. All right. Really looking forward to catching it out catching it out, checking it out. Jeez. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> My words. Watch uh, watch a couple of episodes because it's uh, it gets more and more it delves into stuff more deeply as it goes. Okay, I, I was really impressed with that. It unpacks a little yeah. bit slower. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the thing about modern television that I just love. You know, yeah. if you're willing to take the long haul, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's great stuff. Yeah, so. and lovely lovely acting from like just the kids are lovely and yeah. Arnold Pinnock. I don't know if you know Arnold Pinnock. Uh, he plays my husband and he's, he's really talented and yeah. Okay. We'll check him out. <laughs> I just got so sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and you, okay. you had mentioned that you're writing a pilot right now. Is that correct? Yes. My writing partner, Andrew Musselman and I, and long time friend, long time friend, grade nine, we sold a pilot to uh, a, a big, a big studio in the States and uh, we've been working on it. It's really, really fun. It's very silly, but also delves into some, some real issues. And um, as, long, as soon as I'm allowed to talk about it, I will. We have a very exciting attachment as well. Ah, yeah, we'll, right. see what happens. we'll see what happens in, in 2021. And this has yeah, a little bit of a sci-fi. Oh, you what now? No, no, no sci-fi for that one. This one does not have the sci-fi. Okay. But what it does have is quite a lot of music. Okay. Um, and it's very hard to do singing right now because of COVID. <laughs> so right. that's kind of the last thing. So um, when when things, you know, when things hopefully do get somewhat normal, then it would be it would be awesome to to make this show because it's really, really fun. Well, I'm glad to hear that they're still moving forward with projects that yes. you know are, are still pushing that are not ideal based on COVID at least, but you know what we, this, we have to have content like that, you know, Glee ran for how many seasons, you know, I'm not saying that your show is Glee, but oh, yeah, you know, yeah. we need to have shows that have a lot of that kind of content in it. So yeah, it is a musical comedy. It's just, a, it's a bit, it's, it's filthy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the kids have to go to bed like... before we put it on. Yes, they might. Yes. <laughs> Jeez. It's been great catching up with you. You too. And, and I uh, have asked once about the whatever's going on behind you, which is terrifying. Well, um, I mean, we've got Atlantis over here. So yes, so yes. these are all fan uh, creations that have been submitted oh God, really? for the show. Yeah, Ke a guy by the name of Kevin made Atlantis. A guy by the name of Tom created um, uh, Destiny just now. Uh, just got that in last week. So Beautiful. yeah, I, it's a whole menagerie of fan. And then there's there's some genuine props from the show, like. Um, uh, this guy right here was originally created for Atlantis season five, and then the helmet and a, the new paint job for uh, SGU seasons one and two. Oh so, my gosh. yeah, so it's nice. I thought it was a lady, huh? I thought it was a lady because of the bra. It's a bra. Oh, just play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I thought when I first looked at it, I was like, oh, she's wearing a bikini. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brian J. Smith's uh, costume. It's and absolutely I, stunning. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, how much does that weigh? It's not light. Um, I would have to say, I mean, with the mannequin inside of it, he's at, at least, he's at least 60 kilos. I think if, I, if, if my math is right. So, cause it's, it's, at, it's around um, 120 pounds. So 130. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a lot of armor and until just then you what now I didn't see the face until you just said that. And so I just had a slight tariff. Like that was, terrifying. yeah, there's a, there's a, 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 a mannequin, mannequin in there. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, have you ever seen Pin? Pen? No. Pin. Pin. No. What is that? Oh Lord. P I N. You are welcome. You are welcome. Okay. Pin was David's first movie. I. Why As haven't I even heard of it? It's kind of a cult classic. A plastic Nightmare. Mm-hmm. Canadian horror film by Sandor Stern, starring David Hewlett and Terry mm -hmm. O'Quinn. Yep. Ah, a life-size yeah. anatomically correct medical dummy in his office, which he calls Pin. <laughs> okay, I'll check yeah. it out. I will. And he, uh, yeah, he has a very special relationship with it. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> that sounds just about right. And that's what that made me think of. So. <laughs> My gosh. Go check that movie out. These anatomically correct dolls that they have now are just absolutely outrageous. <laughs> and the stuff that people do with them. So... David was like um, 18 or something. Oh, he was when a he kid. Feature and he got the lead and he looks like Jude Law. Okay. I'll like check he's beautiful. <laughs> okay. He's like this little beautiful blonde. I've seen pictures that he had posted like on his Facebook or somewhere pictures of him when he was little. I'm like, that looks like Baz, but it's not Baz. It's, it's really like, weird. Yeah. Yeah. It's his little clone. So. Before he was a character actor. Right. He decided. He made a decision to be a character actor. He really did. Well, he um it's it's fun to be to play a niche of yourself that is yeah. is more off the wall. You know, yeah. you're gonna have you're gonna have more fun, you know. And you know, he's he's definitely managed to be do what he's do is what he's yeah, I can't talk today, Kate. He, he's definitely thing. managed to do what he's wanted to do. So yeah. I yeah. just watched um, the uh, the Navy film that he was in, where he was a. I haven't seen that yet. He was a general. It was excellent. Oh, I'm trying okay. to remember the the name of it, but it's worth watching. Big uh, director. It had a big director. Yes, uh, it was um, uh, Michael Bay. Wasn't it Michael Bay? Now I've got to look. Yeah, I got to look too. People at home are yelling at the screen right now. Right, what I know that? exactly. What was it called? General. I just spelled my brother's name wrong. It's good. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, no, it's not splice. Humility. Uh, Midway. Midway. Yeah, Roland Emmerich. Excuse me, not yes. Michael Bay. I didn't think it was Michael I was Bay. I thinking action actor, but yeah, no. Yeah, he he had an interesting because Roland directed Stargate, so he had a really interesting. Um, oh. Yeah. Very cool. That. Yeah. So I will check out Pin. You you must. <laughs> I will. You simply must. I just saw Cube like four years ago, and it was fantastic. Oh, Cube's awesome. Cube's yeah. awesome. It was Pin, sad, Pin's awesome. sad like, ending, but um, yeah, yeah, it was sad. Yeah. It was sad, but it was really uh, excellent. I mean, Vincenzo Natale, right? Oh man. Uh, but Pin Pin's worth watching. It's just creepy as anything. It's creepy. Creepy as is anything. good. Got to have Woo! a little creepy every now and then. Yeah. David's creepy. <laughs> I would love to have you back um, way later on in the year when, when you get uh, into a new rhythm. And uh, uh, I'd like to go into more detail about some of the other episodes. So sure. it's, it's been... I'll have a little person with me. Oh, absolutely. Yes. See the baby. <laughs> Thanks so much to Kate Hewlett for joining me in this episode of Dial the Gate. And congratulations once again to her. In the spirit of Jeannie Miller, we've got some fan art from Captain Sue's. This title is Christmas Countdown 17, so I guess she did a whole series for uh, for a Christmas season, and the caption is, Jeannie Miller is rightfully suspicious of any president Rodney would sign as Uncle Mayor. I saw that on DeviantArt and thought it was extremely cute, so I had to share that with you guys. Giveaway for the month of uh, February. Excuse me. I was like, March? Is it March yet? No. Giveaway for the month of February. You can own a piece of the Pegasus Dial Home device. For the month of February, Dial the Gate is partnering with Empire Movie Props to give away this piece of the DHD from the episode Phantoms in Stargate Atlantis. To enter to win, you need to use a desktop or laptop computer to visit dialthegate.com. Scroll down to Submit Trivia Questions. Your trivia that you enter may be used in a future episode of Dial the Gate, either for our monthly trivia night or for a special guest to ask me in a round of trivia. There are three slots for trivia, one easy, one medium, and 
one hard. Only one needs to be filled in, but you're more than welcome to submit up to three questions. Please note, the submission form does not currently work for mobile devices. Your trivia must be received no later than March the 1st. If you're the lucky winner, I'll be notifying you via your email right after the start of the new year to get your address. And big thanks to Empire Movie Props for making this item available to a member of our audience. Merchandise! Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, but we do appreciate you watching. And if you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag. We're now offering t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages in a variety of sizes and colors at Redbubble. We currently offer four themed designs and hope to add more in the future. The word cloud designs have both a solid background or transparent background options, so you have some flexibility in choosing a light or dark color. Do keep that in mind when you're making your selection. Checkout is fast and easy, and you can even use your Amazon or PayPal account. Just visit dialthegate.redbubble.com, and thank you for your support. If uh, you don't want to buy some merchandise, it really means a great deal to me if you click the like button and consider subscribing to the show. YouTube's algorithm uh, promotes uh, the different channels based on those kinds of uh, inputs, so it, it really does make a huge difference. Richard Johns from Empire Movie Props is a live interview, and that is coming up next right here on Dial the Gate. I do appreciate your time. Thanks so much to Summer, Ian, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy Rees. You guys are fantastic. My moderating team, Jennifer Kirby and Linda, the gate gabber, Fury, my right hand. I really appreciate you joining me on Dial the Gate and stick around for the next episode. See you on the other side.